Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you and just worship together. Uh, for those of you who uh, know me, uh, you'll know that uh, being fashionable is not one of my strong points. Um, I wouldn't say uh, I'm out of style or I'm outmoded. Uh, let's just say I'm uh, fashionably challenged. Okay, uh, everything that 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 uh, I wear that people think is nice uh, was given to me by somebody. Uh, hardly anyone compliments me on things that I picked out myself, but that's okay. That's okay. And not only that, but I'm also pretty conservative when it comes to the, the latest fashions. So, like when, when something new comes out, you know, new style or something, it, it usually takes me a good three to four years before I think. I can wear that. You know, I remember uh, pleated pants. Uh, they, they, they became popular in the 80s. Okay, that was long before many of you were born. Uh, many before some of your parents were born. I'm just kidding. Uh, but anyway, I, uh, <clears throat> back in the 80s, pleated pants came out. And I saw my band director wearing these pleated pants. And, you know, a lot of people were wearing that. I could say, I, I remember just watching him and saying, oh, I could never wear those. I could never wear those. And then um, finally in the 90s, I think I finally felt, I think that's all they were selling at the time. So I finally said, I think. I can actually wear pleated pants. So I started wearing pleated pants. Sadly, I was told that they had already gone out of style years ago. Uh, but the problem is, by the time I like something, they're already out of style. Um, but I keep them anyway because I hear pleated pants are coming back in. So at least that's what I read online. Anyway, uh, I can see myself you know, going to a fashion consultant. And, and they'll say, Barry, we are going to bring your wardrobe into the 20th century. And I'll say, don't you mean the 21st century? And they'll say, let's take it one century at a time. All right, very good. Okay, anyway, so, so something that a lot of people like to wear nowadays is, is designer clothes. I don't know if you have any designer clothes, uh, but just having a certain label uh, on an article of clothing makes it, one, twice to ten times more expensive. Uh, but, but having that association with, with Gucci or Louis Vuitton made you look, uh, or um, uh, Vera Wang or Armani or something like that, Makes you trendy, right? Makes you with it and, and makes you feel a little bit more unique or makes you feel a bit more confident. It could also make you very poor, but that's beside the point. Uh, and, and I know some of us are very, very picky when it comes to the labels of, of the clothing that we'll wear. We'll only get it from certain stores or from certain labels, right? Uh, now, as believers in Jesus Christ, do you know that we too have the designer's label and that we are to wear the designer's clothes. The question is, is, are you aware of this designer's label? And are you actually wearing the designer's clothes? Uh, this is important because just as wearing a designer label in terms of clothing and designer clothes can affect how you feel about yourself, uh, being aware of the designer's label and, the designer's, and wearing the designer's clothes will affect how you live and, and how you interact with people. And Paul talks about these things in the book of Colossians. So let's all turn to Colossians chapter 3. We're looking at verses 12 to 14 today. And we have Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, would like to uh, borrow a Bible, just raise your hand. Our ushers will give you a, a church Bible that you can borrow. We are on page 984, 984 in the church Bible. And I encourage you all to put away your phones unless you're using a Bible app. And let's do our best to... Uh, really focus on what God might have to say to us. And so let's just have a word of prayer quickly. Lord, as we look into your word, we pray that you would speak to each and every one of us, no matter where we are in our faith, uh, that you, your spirit, would, would move, move us uh, to want to live a life of worship throughout the week in response to your word. And so speak through me to all of us. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're going through a book, uh, going through the book of Colossians, and uh, in the beginning of this chapter, we were told that we have died and we have been raised with Jesus Christ, and that changes everything about us. It changes how we live. Now we have an eternal perspective because we're not living for this world anymore. We're living for eternity. And so there are things that we are to put to death in our lives. These are sins against God, sins against His design, because we're now in a relationship with Him. And so we change how we interact with some of these things that are sins against Him. And then there are things we learned a couple weeks ago to things that we take up. And these are sins against one another. Uh, these are things that turn disagreements into conflicts. Uh, we don't want to be people who hurt one another, especially in the church family. 
So now we've put to death some things, we've taken off some things. Now what do we do? Well, now that we've taken things off, we should put something on. And now Paul gives us a very good list. So the first thing that we find in this uh, first, take a look at verse 12, and it says this in chapter 3 of Colossians. It says, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Okay, so first thing we need to do as we have taken off all these things is to embrace the designer's label. Embrace the designer's label. Three things that we're called here in this passage. First, we're called chosen. Chosen, okay? And when we're chosen, that gives us purpose. It gives us, hopefully, motivation to be what God wants us to be. The idea that God chose you personally, by name, to be his representative and to be his witness for him should give you a real sense of privilege and purpose that should be taken seriously because you have been called by the almighty God of this universe. When I got into college, I auditioned to be a trombonist in our college's symphony orchestra. And one of my dreams when I was in high school was to be the first chair trombonist of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. But that was not going to happen because I wasn't majoring in music or anything like that. So this is the next best thing, okay? So I, I auditioned in front of the first, their, their, their chair trumpet, their first chair horn, and the director, and I played the best that I could. And then I remember a few days later, I got a call from the conductor, and he told me that I was chosen to be the first chair trombonist of the MIT Symphony. And I was so excited because I had been chosen for such an awesome role and awesome privilege. You know, we see in Scripture that God's people are chosen by God for a special purpose or a special destiny. And it's not something that we earn. It's not something that we have to be good enough to, to, to be like I had to be good enough for the symphony because we can never, ever be good enough for God. So we are chosen by God's grace to be in his family. It's something that none of us deserve, okay? No matter how good you are or not, you don't deserve this calling. But whether you believe it or not, it's the best thing that could ever happen to you or to me because this, with this choosing comes eternal life. And not only that, but a relationship with the almighty God of this universe. And you can have this relationship by receiving this free gift that God offers every one of us to realize that we are sinners who have offended an almighty God who created us. And that because of that sin, we all deserve death. We all deserve eternal separation from God in hell. But God loved us so much, he didn't want to see us eternally separated from him. So he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to live the perfect life that we couldn't live and to die on that cross to pay our penalty of death for us. He died in our place. And he promises that when you repent, turn from your sin, and believe that Jesus died and rose again for your sin, you will be saved from that eternity separated from God. And Jesus proved that he was able to do this by rising again. The resurrection proves that Jesus is who he said he was, and that he indeed not only defeated sin, but also defeated death. That is a great and awesome privilege that you and I have been chosen to receive. Just, just let that sink in for a moment. That we have eternal life and we have a relationship with the almighty God of this universe. Because it is so easy to take that for granted. That I should be saved. I'm pretty good. But no, he did nothing but death. That we have given life by God's grace. We've also been chosen for a purpose. And that purpose is to glorify God and to make him known. That we are now building a close and intimate relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We're chosen so that we can build up the body of Christ so that others might have that closer, more intimate relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And we also have this purpose of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with those who do not know him so that they might begin to have a relationship with God. Because again, that is the most important thing at the end of this life. That's the most important thing that anyone will have to know is do they have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? That's all that is going to matter. So folks, we have a high privilege. We have a really high privilege of being chosen to have a relationship with the living God. 
to, to, to represent him to the world. Be able to be used by God to have an impact that could last forever. When you have been used by God to bring someone into, the pres- into a relationship with God, you have changed eternity. You've been used by God to change eternity. So strive to fulfill that purpose for which you have been chosen. So that's the first label, chosen. The second label is holy. Holy, that distinguishes us when you are called holy. There's two aspects to holiness in Scripture. First, it means to be set apart. Set apart for a purpose or dedicated for a purpose. Okay, We have been set apart from the world as followers of Jesus Christ. Okay, that means we are to be different because we're set apart. We are to be different. The goal is not to blend in and to be like the world, okay? We are not to be like everyone else. That's kind of what designer laborers do, right? They, they, they each have their own characteristic. Uh, they're not supposed to be like everyone else. So when we have this designer's label from God, we are not to be like everyone else. We're set apart. That's the first part of being set apart. The second part, deals in terms of our character and our conduct, being free from sin. See, because we are different, we are to put away these sinful habits and attitudes that we talked about earlier in this chapter, because these are the ways that the world is. The world is full of conflict. The world is full of anger and wrath and malice and slander and obscene talk. That's how the world is. I was just listening to one of these songs that are very, very popular, all these cuss words. That's how the world thinks. And I guess the idea is that you're supposed to follow along and sing those same words. And I hope we can discern what words should be coming out of our mouths, that we are not to be like the world. So we put those away. You know, throughout the Bible, Christians are called saints. Saints, okay? Saints, same word, holy ones. We are holy ones. That's what God identified us as. In the Old Testament, the Israelites, they were set apart by the law of Moses. They were to be different from all the nations around them, right? That's how, by how they lived, okay? They were to be different in what they wore. They were to be different in what they ate. Uh, it was very more external in terms of what they were, how they were different because they were to distinguish themselves from those around them. But once Christ came, he brought a new covenant, and we are set apart now by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So when you come to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and resides in you when you accept Christ as your Savior. So we don't really have to follow the Old Testament law anymore. We now live by the Spirit, the Spirit who guides us in terms of how we should live, that sets us apart from the entire world. And this is much more internal, okay? We spend as manifest in how we think and how we act. So the point is, is, is that God has imparted his character on us through the Holy Spirit so that we are not to be like the world. We are to be holy. We are to be set apart. We are to be different. You might stick out a little bit. We might be attacked for that, but we wear that proudly because we represent the almighty God of this universe. The third label is beloved. And that should give us confidence, okay? Designer labels, you know, they might make us more accepted by the world, right? But remember, not only are we chosen, but we're also loved and accepted by God. He, he wants a relationship with us because he truly loves us. See, love and acceptance, they're, they're pretty big things for most people, right? We want to be loved. We want to be accepted by other people. It's a major, motiv- major motivation for why we do a lot of the things that we do. We act a certain way for acceptance. We might seek achievements for love and acceptance. We might wear certain things for love and acceptance. And, you know, that's why we are so afraid to step out and take risks, because we fear failure. And, and failure can lead to us being rejected by others, Right? We want to be loved, and we, we feel that failure makes us lose that love and acceptance from others. And that's how the world works, okay? Again, back when I was in the symphony orchestra at MIT, uh, there was one piece that we were playing that was really difficult, and I had a solo in that piece, and I had been in the brass ensemble the hour before the symphony rehearsal. So when we got to that part in the, in the solo, I just did not have the chops to do it. I, I kept splattering the note. It was really, really embarrassing. He had me try to do it over and over again, and I, I just couldn't do it because my lips were shot from being in the brass ensemble. So anyway, a week later, he said, hey, um, I decided to put you on second chair on that one piece. So I was demoted because I did not perform 
And then the following year, I got cut from the orchestra. That's how the world works. You have to earn your position, okay? But in Christ, we never lose that love. Romans 8 tells us this. For I am sure, Paul says, that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation, not even flubbing a note in the symphony orchestra, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, not even failure, can separate you from the love of God as you are, when you are following Jesus Christ. Whether you fail or not, you are always loved by God. That gives us confidence. You don't have to earn his approval. You already have it when you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Remember that. You are loved. And this is our designer's label, folks. We are chosen by God. We are chosen for a purpose. We are holy and set apart for that purpose. And we are really beloved by God. So be mindful of your label and wear it out. Second, verse 12 says this, okay? Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Okay, so, so we are now told to wear the designer's clothes, okay? Put on. Uh, it says, put on then. Uh, and the tense of this command in the original language has a sense of urgency. Urgency. You've just taken off a bunch of things. Now put some clothes on, is what Paul is saying, all right? You are told in verse 10 to put off the old, put on the new self. Uh, remember verse 5, we were told five vices to put to death that dealt with our relationship with God. Then these five vices we are to take off in the earlier verses, those are, 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 are things that dealt with our relationship with each other, things that hurt our relationship with each other. And the best way to take those things off is to don't interact with anyone, right? If I don't interact with anyone, then I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to have any malice or wrath or slander or obscene talk, right? Because I'm not interacting with anybody, okay? But that's not what, what God wants for us. So here are five virtues he wants all of us to put on as we interact with other people. Okay, so what do we put on first? is compassionate hearts. Compassionate hearts. And that literally, in the original language, means bowels of compassion. Bowels of compassion. Uh, back then, the guts or the bowels, those were seen as the seat and the source of love and of sympathy and mercy. Okay, so it was in your, in your, in your, in your, in your guts or your bowels. Now, if you read the newspapers or, or, or listen to news reports uh, online or something like that, you might read or hear about the war in Ukraine and people are dying there. Uh, you might read about those who are, are dealing with the horror of natural disasters. You know, there was just, a, a, I think, a, a tornado down in Missouri or something like that. 200 some people passed away. Or you might read about the shootings in the city of Chicago. And you might think, man, that's terrible, that's sad, that's awful, um, that, that's harsh, that, that's, that's, man, I... I that's a terrible thing to have happen. I can't imagine how difficult that would be to go through that. But then you generally go on to doing something else, and you don't think much about it during the rest of the day. But when something like this happens to you, or when it happens to someone that you love and care about, that gets your gut, doesn't it? That's where you really feel it, because you really care for that person. And that's what a heart of compassion is. When you have a heart of compassion, it means that you have a heartfelt or a gut-felt sympathy for the needs of others that moves you to action. It's been defined as your pain in my heart. Your pain in my heart. You feel other people's pain. You, you understand what they're experiencing, and you see their need. And what you do for others is not done out of obligation or a sense of duty or because you're expected to. It's done because you're moved in your heart to do it. Your heart of compassion moves you to expression because you want to do something for that person. So are you a very compassionate person? Are you a very compassionate person? A person who truly cares about others and seeks to serve others? Or would you say you're a more hard-hearted person? Compassionate people, they're very others-centered. Their heart goes out to others. Does that describe you? Or are you a more selective person? You only care about certain people, those who like you and those who are like you. And that sort of compassion is, is really more selfish. 
you only care about those who do something for you or who return a favor. And that's oftentimes how cliques get formed, you know. I don't care about anyone else other than my gang, my clique. And we have to be careful that sort of thing doesn't happen here. A clique is a close-knit group of people who exclude others. Okay? There's nothing wrong with a close-knit group of people. Okay? We want to have good, strong, healthy, Christ-centered relationships. But when you exclude others intentionally, or even sometimes unintentionally, you're basically saying, stay away. You don't belong. Okay? And, and people like that, their hearts are hardened towards others so that they don't reach out because they're just concerned about their own people. And you might recognize this happening, but are you doing anything about it as you interact with people? Uh, things like this can happen easily, like after worship services or, or during after fellowship or before fellowship. You know, there's clicks here and there. Uh, newcomers come and, and no one talks to them. That's a terrible feeling, awkward feeling, right? That kind of feeling makes you not want to come back if no one is reaching out to you. But compassion, you understand that feeling. You understand that feeling. And, and sometimes you, know, you just don't want people to get the feeling that, that you'd rather they never came back than for you to go up and, and talk to them and, and welcome them. I remember you know, I was visiting a church in Seattle a long time ago, and you know, Christine was uh, uh, at a conference, and so Sunday morning I happened to visit this church, and uh, you know, I, I introduced myself. You know, they had people stand up and introduce themselves, so I did that. And uh, after the service, no one talked to me. And, and I'd taken a shower, so it wasn't bad. I was wondering, you know, it was just, they were all talking to themselves, and people would nod, and, and that was about it. Same happened a lot of times in the churches we visit here during my sabbatical. Just people would nod, and that was, there was no sense of reaching out. And if, did you think I felt like, hey, I want to come back to this place? Not really. And I hope that doesn't happen here. I hope that anyone who steps through our doors will feel, man, this is a place that cares. That they see the love of Jesus through every person that they meet. Don't have a hardened heart, but an open heart. And there's a lot of different needs in our church as well. Do you see them? And are you moved to ask God what your role might be in them? Our children's ministry could use some help. Uh, we could use help in our nursery, maybe watching the baby, uh, supporting our missionaries. You know, we used to have a mission support team, but we don't have many people who are doing that right now. But, you know, keeping in touch with our various missionaries that we support. Uh, would be something that's very helpful. Or just caring for others and building relationships. Because that's what the ch church is. It's not about just a program. It's about relationships that we have with one another. Uh, reaching out to others is a very strong ministry that might not have a title, but it holds the church together. Or maybe you're more serious about discipling someone. Maybe God has given you some maturity that you can use to help someone who's younger in the faith or someone who's younger in age that you can help them grow and become what God wants them to be. There are tons of ways in which you can use your compassionate heart to reach out to others. And for those of you who are in ministry, are you serving out of compassion? Or are you serving out of duty and obligation or, or guilt? Let's make sure that all of us put on compassion. Pray for it. Allow God to mold it into your heart. So are you asking God for it? Or is your heart still hard? Ask God to tend to your heart. Compassion. The second one we're told is kindness. Kindness takes the initiative in responding generously to others' needs. Okay? The ancient writers define kindness as the virtue of a person whose neighbor's good is as dear to him as his own. Okay? So it's the actual expression of compassion. You, you, you want to help others and you actually express your care for them. So it's both word and action. Kindness asks, how can I help you? And then does it. Uh, kindness says things that, that build others up. Uh, you know, if someone asks this question, if someone were to pay you a dollar for every kind word that you said about people, and then take back 50 cents for every unkind word you said or about people, would you be poor or rich? Is kindness on your tongue because of what you say about others. Put on kindness. Third is humility. Humility is an attitude of self-esteem that is neither puffed up with pride nor is it self-deprecating to where you think you're no good. Okay, You have a true understanding when you're humble of your position with God. 
You don't care really who gets the credit. There's no comparison. There's no sense of competition. No arrogance and self, self-boasting. That brings about a lot of discord and, and bad feelings between people. But humility, it allows us to serve others without caring whether it's noticed or not. We just want God's work to be done, no matter who gets it. It's not about me. It's all about me. I think uh, someone once said, humble people, I think it's North, Norman Vincent Peale, humble people don't think less of themselves. They just think about themselves. That's a good description of humility. Have you been wearing humility? The fourth attitude here is meekness. It's also translated gentleness in other passages. That's a consideration for others and a willingness to give up one's rights for the sake of another. Uh, the word in the original language means power under control. It's just the ability to criticize, maybe criticize another's conduct so that they see it as a help and not a condemnation. Okay, that's, that's gentleness. Gentleness knows when and how to criticize when it's necessary. You know, I, I see it as just basically having no sharp edges. You don't really stick people unnecessarily, okay? Um, no sharp edges. You know, I, most of you know I've been married for about 20 years. And some of you heard this story before. Uh, but, you know, initially, you know, sometimes it's very quick to criticize that you're married. You know, you have these differences. Uh, and sometimes you just react to the way you criticize. And so, um, you know, my wife, Christine, you know, she's my, my best critic. Uh, but she's, she's learned how to, how to say things to, to help me get on the right path. She won't just yell at me or just say, you're wrong or, you know, what's wrong with you. Uh, she'll come up to me silently or quietly and say, you know, for future reference, next time we're out, can you, you know, do this? You know, so it's, it's very, very carefully worded. So it's not like, why did you do that for? It's more for future reference. And I know it's coming. But then she gently says, can you try doing this next time? And it really encourages me instead of puts me down. That's gentleness. Uh, you might have heard of Abraham Lincoln, right? Uh, no one treated Abraham Lincoln with more contempt than this guy named Edwin Stanton. Okay, he denounced Lincoln's policies. He called him a low cunning clown, okay, publicly, right? Now, Lincoln never said anything in reply to Edwin Stanton. In fact, he made Stanton his secretary of uh, war because Stanton was the best person for the job, okay, in, in Lincoln's mind. Um, and Lincoln always treated him with courtesy no matter how Stanton treated Lincoln. Uh, Stanton was a very capable person, but he was noted for his brusqueness and for his rigid opinion. So once Lincoln had to write Stanton a note, and the messenger brought the note to Stanton, Stanton read it, he tore up the note and said, President Lincoln is a f-. Left it at that, so the messenger went back to President Lincoln, and he told President Lincoln what the secretary had said, and Lincoln says with a grin, well, perhaps Stanton is right. No sense of retaliation, no anger. He's just a very gentle person. When he was attacked, he didn't retaliate. That's gentleness. Are you a person that's marked by gentleness? The fifth one that Paul mentions is patience. Patience, that's long-suffering. That's the ability to put up with people who are irritable, who irritate you or annoy you. So when you're wrong, there's no pursuit of retaliation. Uh, You know, that night that Lincoln was assassinated. Stanton stood in a room off to the side where Lincoln's body was lying. And he, as he looked down on Lincoln's dying body, and he saw his face, Stanton said through his tears, there lies the greatest ruler of men the world has ever seen. Lincoln's patience over this long time had paid off. Patience. The patience of love that conquered in the world. So are you a patient person? How do you respond when you irritate each other? So these are the designer's clothes. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Are you wearing them each and every day? Especially at home. Are you wearing these at home? You know, we were told the things that take off that hurt relationships. You put these on to build relationships. Okay, so we'll know your designer's label, wear the designer's clothes, and lastly, this verse, pick up verse 13. 
Paul says, bearing with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So the third thing we are told to do is to strive to look like Christ. As you put on this designer label and the designer's clothes, strive to look like Christ. You don't want to be dressed up with no place to go. Okay? So Paul gives us several areas in which we are to apply these characteristics. First, he says, bearing with one another. Bearing with one another. Okay? So we endure. We put up with others. Okay? This is a manifestation of patience. Even when they fail. Even when they act differently from what is expected. Okay? And God has made all of us very different. Okay? Um, and that's a good thing. Because that gives us a lot of variety. It gives us a lot of different perspectives. It helps us to see different sides of an issue. And it's a very, very good thing to have that we're different. But it can be a negative thing because it's hard to put up sometimes with some of these differences. You know, some people just think of different wavelengths and sometimes it can be very difficult when they're constantly thinking very differently from you. But those who wear the designer's clothes strive, do their best in the power of the Holy Spirit to put up with those differences and continue to interact instead of avoid those who are different. You know, when Jesus was here, okay, he had to bear with a lot of difficult people, okay? The Pharisees, who were constantly trying to trap him and eventually tried to kill him and eventually succeeded him. Then there were the disciples, okay? The disciples, who oftentimes, they just weren't getting it, okay? There, there, there's a few fries of a Happy Meal, okay? They just weren't getting it. Uh, th that's something that we have to learn how to do, especially now that we have combined youth and adults here in our worship service, right? Adults can easily think, you know, the youth, they're, they're too immature, they're, they're, too, they're too distracted. The adults might, uh, the youth might think, you know, the, the adults, they're too stodgy, you know, they're, they're, they're too serious, they're too strict. But we have to bear with one another. But this is not just the kind of you know, grin and bear, okay, I'll deal with it. Just avoid each other, we'll just bear with one another. But it has to be done with the designer's clothes, with compassion, with kindness, with humility, meekness. And patient. So how are you at bearing with others with the designer's clothes? Because oftentimes I know it's just a grin and bear type of thing. Let me just get through this and get out of here. But we need to have this designer clothes in terms of how we bear with one another. The third one, or the next one, is that we not only bear with one another, but we also forgive one another. Forgive one another. Because these differences that we have from time to time means that you will, from time to time, be offended. By someone else, whether intentionally or unintentionally, we're just going to be offending each other left and right. And it says here, if one has a complaint against another, and the word for complaint can also mean blame, uh, comes from a word which means to find fault with someone or to be sad, dissatisfied with someone. Okay, so if you're offended by someone, uh, th this is what you're, you're supposed to be able to forgive them. Okay, this bearing and forgiving it speaks to the offended party, not the offending person. All right. So the person who is offended should take initiative in enduring and forgiving. Okay? That doesn't mean we don't confront. It doesn't mean we just allow people to walk all over us. The word means that we are quick to forgive, that we don't hold grudges. We don't want to hold grudges. We don't want to hold things against the person. We don't want to retaliate when we've been wrong. So no matter what, we're going to strive to have a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience toward that person. Again, I don't think it means that we never deal with offenses. It means that we deal with them whether we need to confront or, or, or share our hurt. The desire is always to restore and to reconcile. I remember when I was back in California, um, out, out, when I was working out there uh, at church, I was joking with a friend. Uh, she was quitting the choir because she had so many other things she had to do. And I was jokingly said, you know, where's your commitment? And I was kind of kidding her about not being a very committed person, which was an obvious joke, okay, because she was the most com committed person I knew to Christ and to everything else. But I was just kidding around. But a few weeks later, and I just thought nothing of it, but a few weeks later, she came up to me and said that she was really hurt by what I had said. Uh, and I was really thankful that she said that because for her, it was kind of putting a, a barrier between us and she was acting a little weird around me when we had been really good friends. 
Uh, and so when I realized what I had said, I asked for her forgiveness, and she was good. She was very quick to forgive. And there, there was no sense of residual pain from that, that experience. But I was so glad that instead of just holding it and getting saying, I got to just get over this, she was willing to say, hey, this really hurt when you said that. I think sometimes we need to, because instead of just holding it and building these walls, sometimes we just need to take initiative when we are offended to bring it out as carefully and as lovingly as possible so that we can take away any of those barriers that are between us. So be forgiven. Be forgiven. Who is our model of forgiveness? Again, Jesus Christ, all right? He was treated the harshest and most violent sort of death known of those days. Yet what did he say on the cross? I said this last week. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. That's being quick to forgive. Harboring resentment and ill will towards others does little good. To do so is beneath us as followers of Jesus Christ. And Jesus himself showed us the way. So it's being forgiven and wanting forgiveness for those who are shown. The last garment is talked about in verse 15, no, 14. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect Above all, okay, so that means love is the most important character quality in the believer's life. Because love binds them all together perfectly. It's like a belt which holds all these other virtues in place. It puts all the other virtues in perfect and unified action. To have all these other virtues without love makes you really nothing. Okay, 1 Corinthians 13, first three verses is a very famous passage. It says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And if I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. So love is really the thing that makes everything else fall into place. That's what we to be making sure as followers of Jesus Christ that that is the number one characteristic that is growing and that is seen by others. Love not only holds all these other things together, but holds the entire Christian family together. Again, the tendency of any body of people is sooner or later to, to fly apart. And it's easy to see that as we grow larger, uh, a little more disjointed will be a little more clicky, uh, a loss of that sense of family. But when there's that true sense of growing love towards one another, we're able to hold together. Love is like the belt that holds us together. See, folks, what is so key to the Christian life is relationships. Relationships. Again, if you were all by yourself, there is no way that you would be able to live out these characteristics without being in relationships with other people. See, the true nature of the Christian life is meant to be in community and relationship. Try to live the Christian life outside the context of community and relationship, and you really can't live the Christian life at all. Because so much of what we read in Scripture is about how we relate to one another. And that's why we stress so much involvement and fellowship, building relationships. First John tells us that the natural result of walking with God is that you fellowship with one another. So if you were someone, you know, it's easy just to come to church and leave right away and not have any interactions with other people. That's missing the point of the Christian life. It's very difficult to walk with God when you're not in fellowship with your church family. So I really encourage you, attend FNF if you're a youth, attend the community groups or family fellowship if you're an adult. But be involved in relationship. Because that's a primary way in which God builds one another up. You might have heard of that fable, The Emperor's New Clothes. Um, there's this con artist uh, seeking royal favor of the king, uh, promises to provide the emperor, the king, with this outfit of clothing that would uh, be really, really special. So delicate, so rare, so special were these clothes was a fabric that he was going to put these clothes on that it would be undetectable to the touch. 
you wouldn't be able to feel it. It's so special, right? And more importantly, they would be invisible to anyone of poor character or inferior ability. So the emperor, okay, I'll try these on. So when the emperor received the, the empty hanger, which these clothes are on, um, he could not admit that he couldn't see them, right? Because if he did that, he would prove that he wasn't worthy of the throne. So he admired the clothes, as did his advisors, and he put them on and strutted proudly around his kingdom, stark naked, okay? Thinking, hey, I'm, I'm wearing something because I'm supposedly wearing That was the story of the emperor's new clothes. And, you know, sometimes we Christians can fall into the same trap. Um, in this chapter of Colossians, Paul said to take off practices such as, you know, fornication, and lying, and greed, and so forth. But the point is that we are to put on new practices to replace the old ones. So have we really put on these positive attitudes, positive attitudes and actions of compassion? And kindness, and humility, and meekness, and gentleness. Now, sometimes the answer is no. Instead, we kind of parade around showing off our new clothes of righteousness and refusing to admit the truth that we are really naked without these clothes on that God has for us. And we walk about blinded by the fact that the world is laughing at us because they don't want our kind of faith. Let's make sure we're putting these on, because that's what the world needs to see. You know, in this political, tense situation that we live in, all they see is us fighting, and yelling, and screaming. And they don't see enough of us fathers of Jesus Christ really caring for others with these kind of characteristics. You know, Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Let's show the world that we are truly followers of Jesus Christ by becoming like Christ, by embracing the designer's label, wearing the designer's clothes, and then looking like Christ. Let's bow for a minute. And what is God saying to you this morning as we look at this designer label? Maybe that's something you have forgotten or you haven't thought much about, the fact that you are chosen, that you are holy and set apart, and that you are beloved. Are any one of those three labels things that you have forgotten that you need to really embrace a little bit more in your life? Let me talk to God about that right now. these new clothes, these, emperor, uh, these uh, designer clothes of compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. Would you say those are things that you continually wear? Maybe one of these, God is saying, this is something that really needs to grow in you. Let me just ask God to help you through his spirit to grow one or two of these characteristics in you that are lacking. about these actions that mirror Christ, whether it be bearing with one another. Maybe there's someone in your life that you have had a difficult bearing with, have difficulty bearing with. Or maybe there's someone that you need to forgive. 
Or maybe there's someone you need to express more love for. Let me talk to God about that first. That you do this week. Be more in line and looking like Christ. Father, we thank you so much for your word, which encourages us. And we thank you so much that you never ask us to do what Jesus himself would not do. But he modeled it for us in every aspect of his life. And so, Lord, help us to, to wear this designer label and embrace it proudly. Of chosen, holy, and beloved. Help us, Lord, to really be marked by compassion kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. That as we bear with one another, as we forgive each other, as we love others, people will see the difference of who have made you. And that they will want that same thing for themselves. So fill us, Lord, use us, and work in us and change us to be more like Jesus.